Welcome back to the second part of the RPS conversation on the extraordinary outburst of music we've seen in homes across Britain in lockdown. I'm James Murphy from the Royal Philharmonic Society and I'm delighted to be joined by the pianist Isa Takana Mason, violinist Catherine Arledge, conductor Helen Harrison and choral director Ben England. Um, maybe Ben and Kath, I, I, I was wanted, wanting you to share with us what have amateur musicians been telling you they valued from the things you've been able to offer um, through all of this? Off to you, Kath. <laughs> <laughs> very polite, aren't we? Very English. Um, well, I think we did a big survey of the children at NCO to to find out what they what they what they were missing essentially, and what and what they what they valued. And it, as I said earlier, it, it was friendship, um, seeing and meeting up with with people. Uh, it was having fun, as uh, simple as that. And it was learning things. So there was a definite. Um, um, some things definitely missing for them and that was the feedback that we've had from the webinars that they, that the people have just kept coming back and back because that's what they're getting they're getting the fun and the learning and the joy and and the, the sense of community and belonging to something when you when you're feeling a little bit isolated i i just completely echo that it's the it is the feeling of community the those people who come along to choir each week or to orchestra um and it is the it's the thing they look forward to most and if that's taken away, well, you know, for a lot of people, that that's a very, very dark thing to have to deal with. And so uh, for a lot of people, although the music is obviously a big part of why they come along and there's an element of re retaining uh, good vocal health, uh, retaining the expertise, being able to still be able to sing the high notes when we come out of lockdown. But for most people, it's about retaining those links or even forging new links um, and being part of something bigger than yourself. Um, I mean, Messiah was was a genuinely moving and actually quite spiritual experience. I don't mean in a religious sense. I just mean in a sense of uh, as I was standing up and conducting, I knew that all around the world there were thousands of people standing and, and singing at that moment. So maybe not exactly at that moment, maybe 20 seconds after I get the downbeat, they start singing. But, you know, it's all happening. And to to just watch hundreds thousands of comments just sort of streaming up just saying i'm crying this is the, one of the best things i've ever done um i can't believe how much this this makes me feel better i can't believe how happy this makes me um and it is just at the end of the day it is needing to be connected to everybody that's what we lost and that's what this technology has allowed us to to rebuild in a new way as, as, as we've said, it's not going to replace face-to-face -face music, but it is going to be a, a, another way of, of forming those bonds. There's a great quotation from C.S. Lewis that kind of lives with me, which was, he said, I read to know that I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think music is even more that <laughs> uh, in, in an extreme version. I think that's what this, this, this kind of work now has, has done, is, is reassured people that you're not, even if you are physically on your own you're not emotionally or spiritually or society wise on your own and in a sense everything that music has been achieving with people playing in the neighborhood uh online and any concerts anything that's happened at all it's it's underlined what we what we know how powerful music is and and what it gives to, apart from just the cultural aspects all those things that we all we all as musicians know about and spend our lives telling people how great it is but this has really underlined that and I, I actually think there's a bit of a moment where obviously we know whether we like it or not things are going to be difficult in the next year or so especially economically but the need for music especially for I would say young people is going to be even more critical um, I've worked with the youth orchestra in Lancashire and their conductor and we had a our first zoom once we got a few things in place and we hadn't had a chance to interact meaningfully, to be honest, with our group until we got the safeguard in place quite rightly. And literally every single person from the orchestra was on that Zoom, which shows how important the orchestra is to them as a young person. But it will be even more important as we move out of this, especially with what we've all been through. And I think we're going to have to work hard to make our cases to look after our musicians that we work with and 
Um, Isato, on World Piano Day, you were actively encouraging pianists everywhere to share clips um, online of them playing at home, like yourself. Um, and and you've, t you've touched on this yourself already. There's been a sort of sense of, of, of leveling, of almost like a kind of a remarkable democratization of music. You know, even Lang Lang stuck at home somewhere. Um, so ha have you felt this change um, your sense of connection with your audience and how you interact with them? Yeah, I mean, um, as I was saying earlier, I think what's incredible is that we're now able to connect with people from all over the world and also the sheer number of people that you're able to connect with. I mean, when you do a live stream, you can connect with, with thousands and thousands of people. Um, you know, what concert hall can, can fit hundreds of thousands of people inside? So I think that's that's been really amazing. I mean, I mean I've definitely felt closer to, to people who people all over the world, audience members, and, and also other musicians. I mean, yeah, pianists such as Lang Lang and um, Tom Boston and Elena have been doing, they've been releasing a piece of music every single day. And I think just to see all these musicians, to get to hear them more often than you normally would, and also to see them kind of in their, in their natural environment, it definitely makes you feel closer to everyone. And I think that's definitely what's been really amazing about this time. I think what's also been particularly inspiring for me is also seeing the the sheer creativity of musicians. I mean we were all hit quite hard by this whole lockdown experience and we all had to suddenly, we had to adapt and we had to adapt quickly and, and drastically and it's been amazing to see all the kind of creative projects that everyone's come up with and the ways in which we've used technology to to make things better for people who are stuck at home. You're right, it really has been a time for discovery, hasn't it? That, that you know, a, an artist who you might not have had the time to go to uh, go out of your way to go and hear a, a, a whole evening's recital of, that you can suddenly get a glimmer of now. So there are now lots of people whose recitals I'm really eager to get to, who I really didn't know about in the past. Yeah, and I think at first there were people kind of worried, saying, oh, if, if artists are putting all this kind of free stuff online, does that mean that, you know, essentially there won't be any more concerts that people will will want to come to. But I think it has the opposite effect. I think seeing and hearing all of this music online, you know, for free and being able to access it just makes you feel more hungry to get out to a concert and, and hear them live. And if I may, it also, I think it allows us to build a relationship with our audience that is more personal, that is more about um, us looking after them and providing a service almost. I mean the quarantine choir, I, I'm there every day, um, two o'clock, and there are people who who set their watch by it. And so I do my ironing and you're on in the background and I really enjoy it. And they send me wonderful messages. They send me photographs of their baking and of their gardens and of all sorts. And it's it's become much more of a sort of two-way process. And I've had people I, I, I run a choir on a Thursday night, well, I did, uh, in Chepstow, just the other side of the Seven Bridge. And uh, we started doing our rehearsals online. And I've got 50 new members of this choir who have joined from all over the world. And the plan is once we get back to face-to-face -face rehearsals, I'm going to stream the rehearsals. Well, there'll be a choir there live, but there'll be a webcam at the back streaming the rehearsals. And so people will be singing along. And a couple of people have actually said, somebody in Germany, someone in America, and when you perform, we will come over and we'll perform with you because we'll know the music. So I think the, what, what we've done is by putting out a lot of free music is to build a lot of goodwill, a lot of gratitude, um, and a lot of a feeling of support. You know, we're trying to support people in, in the way that we can. Um, I think Kathy was saying your, your husband's medical, my wife's a medic. Um, and I just felt, always felt that, uh, you know, I'm not a frontline worker. I, I, I can't be on the front line and, and help in that way that perhaps I would want to, but I can help in this way. And I can put out choir rehearsals and I can put out singing to give people um, that sense of community and that sense of belonging so that when lockdown is lifted, perhaps it's helped them and maybe they'll come and watch one of my concerts or come and join a choir. Or, you know, so there is that that's a reciprocal relationship that we've built. I think there's something in that about being more relevant or, or finding a relevance or a new relevance with people because we've got this technology to help us do that and understanding what people are needing and feeling and we, we felt that playing on the street I think every week we had to kind of try and judge the mood of the nation almost in what we picked to play because um, 
if you pick the wrong thing, you could get it so wrong, you know? So um, for example, we had, I mean, the beginning, we stuck with quite a lot of slow, quite contemplative stuff because that's what the mood felt like. But right from quite early on, we had Can Can in our repertoire. And I thought, we can't put Can Can out. I don't think we'll probably ever be able to put Can Can out. But then there came a moment when we could, when people just wanted to have a little bit more fun and be a little bit silly. And, and then we had them all Can Canning out, out here. Um, and that, that, felt, that felt relevant and right. But I, I think it's exactly what you say. It's about understanding what the need is and building that connection. Yeah. And, that, and that's think, something. Yeah. And because I think it's had to happen so quickly. In a way, the, the function of music to, uh, I, don't, I don't mean entertain in a, in a shallow way, it's become more real. And, and you know, when, when you're playing, and the neighbours say, oh, we, when, I've been playing the piano, but literally for actual pleasure. But then you hear the neighbours, oh, we loved it, I'm lucky they liked it. They said, oh, we've been out, when, when we hear practice, we come out with a glass of wine. And then there is the pressure occasionally, oh, gosh, I really actually need to practice this. And, and then... <laughs> But, but actually, we fundamentally, you know, that, that actual very close connection with an audience where they're the people you really know. It's kind of back to kind of how it probably all started out, isn't it? People singing uh, very basically and connecting. And in a way, our concert halls are fantastic, but the nature of the space has lent itself to distance in, in a way that sometimes is, is unhelpful. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And I've definitely been noticing more of a willingness to kind of, I don't know, experience music in, in a more fun way, because I've always passionately believed that music should be fun. Um, and fun doesn't mean, you know, silly or, or, or not played, played well, but just fun in the sense that everyone should, should feel relaxed. And, you know, when these NHS claps were happening, happening weekly, um, my, my siblings started going out to the streets and just playing a bit of Jewish klezmer music for the neighbours. And they really loved it. And it really kind of brought a sense of community um, in the area. And I think these kind of things just, just wouldn't have happened normally. And it's been really lovely to see it happening now. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you all think this might rouse more people to find their own inner music, uh, maybe to join a choir for the first time or to dust off a childhood instrument in the attic? Um, and what might you say to encourage such people? Well, I personally really, really hope so. And I mean, I, I personally think that music is, is something that even if you haven't been studying it or you may have never played an instrument in your life or may have not played one for years, it, it's never too late. And I think even if it's just for your own pleasure and you don't intend to play to anyone else, I think music can just bring you so much um, kind of joy and just fulfillment. And I think this time has really highlighted that for many people. So I really hope that, you know, now that people are at home more, they're, they're starting to play music more when they perhaps may not otherwise have done so. Mm. I've got a little anecdote there that they, I don't teach very much because I haven't got time, but I, I do teach one one student who started the playing the violin when she was 50 and has done her grade eight now and is now in her mid sixties, I think. Um, and I just, I'm totally loyal to her because of that amazing, remarkable journey. She's done an open university music degree in, in that time. And, you know, just it's been a, it's become a huge part of her life. So I think, absolutely it's never too late and it's also not I think it's not you know it's very easy to think it's a talent thing and I haven't got talent and I would just try and bust that whole myth out the water as well because so much of it is about wanting to have a go trying and um having some fun as as Ista says fun is definitely underrated yeah and I think as well with um, there's been so much success in online teaching as well so the issue of being busy and working, you know, there's, uh, let's say there's going to be so many teachers out there who can now teach you online if you've got an instrument. So just do it. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the, the model of, of watching somebody um, teaching you through a, through a camera and being, in, being on the other side and being safe because they can't see you and they can't hear you. You know, I hear a lot from my choristers, well, I never would have sung this if I had the, if there was any chance that anyone could actually hear me. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm getting all wrong and you're still smiling and you're still saying well done and I really appreciate that and so I've got people who um, who sing in my Thursday night choir and you know, see, sing pop songs and folk songs who've come along and sung Handel's Messiah for the very very first time uh, had, had only ever heard the hallelujah chorus and even then only the first eight bars <laughs> and so they've actually learned the whole thing and I mean at, for some of these people, 
it was like learning to run the marathon. It really was. It took, you know, we worked on it for nine weeks and throughout it, I have choristers texting me on WhatsApp, you know, I'm exhausted and I've, I've just been singing the first part of Messiah, how on earth. And by the end, you know, that just, streams of emojis crying emojis on the concert day i can't believe how much this piece has changed my life i can't wait to come and sing it in, you know for real in the albert hall and and what it's done is i think the thing that this has given people in addition to everything that you folks have said you're absolutely right but i think it's a feeling of permission it's okay you know we're all in our houses we're doing our best I and mean, the number of times i've been taking an online rehearsal and i've made a complete hash of something live in front of thousands of people i've had to say sorry everyone should we just do that again and and i've had messages from people say i really appreciate that that just really humanizes the whole process you're human we're human um you know and, and the, the, a couple of times i've been taking a rehearsal you know dressed up properly but i'm wearing you know, brightly colored shorts or something and people get a glimpse <laughs> i said it's just like newsreader i i do have legs how, how, are you well, what color are your shorts today then <laughs> uh, <they're laughs> <blue. Is> that... <laughs> <laughs> i'm wearing blue shorts <laughs> thank you very much right. um i really hope that other people listening um go and seek out all the wonderful things that you've, you've been doing musically online um, during lockdown but i wanted to ask you what has in musically inspired each of you in lockdown, whose endeavours have you loved and recommend our listeners seek out? Present company accepted, of course, because you guys have all been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for, from my point of view, it, it's been all, all of the little messages I've had pop up on WhatsApp. Um, uh, and there have been some amazing professional uh, musicians putting out music, but it's been the families. Uh, there was an incredible family from, I think, around where I am here in Bristol, who put out a Les Miserables medley of them singing about lockdown. And it's, it's things like that, people taking an existing work and, and putting a, a humorous spin on it, you know, to make us all laugh. Songs about tins of spam and toilet rolls and all the rest of it. Um, I just love the ingenuity and the, the, the feeling of actually this, this is a... This is a challenge that we as a species are having to rise to and we're doing it through music and we're doing it through laughter and it was all of those people as i say who who found a way to make us laugh through music i i think that was just inspirational yeah for me it would definitely be uh, i think i mentioned earlier that i've been listening to lots of tom poster and uh, violinist elena uriosti and they've been quarantining together um I'm not sure where but they've been putting out videos every day of kind of arrangements and pieces of music and, and funny things. And I mean, not only was I impressed by their sheer commitment to doing something every day when we were found it a lot doing something twice or once a week, um, but it was also lovely to see the creativity of the arrangements that they did as well. So that's definitely something I'd recommend. I think they put them all on uh, Instagram. Well, I've, I'm going to talk about something non-musical. I've quite enjoyed listening to like lots of podcasts um, on various things, um, opera podcasts. There's been so many conductors talking about the journeys and then listening to different people, musicians talking about their experiences. It's just been nice to hear about other people's journeys to where they got. Uh, and I've loved a lot of the inspiring content being able to watch, like some amazing masterclasses, concerts. But then... Um, I thought one of the things that, just one really random thing, I, I came across uh, the jazz pianist and vocalist um, Blossom Deering. I just hit this one song, uh, Saving My Feeling For You. And you know when you just got a song that is just in your mind? And obviously there's lots of other classical music swimming around that I'm dealing with daily. And that, that was it. It's got like some like really exquisite kit playing in it as well. So, random. Well, I've really enjoyed all those things that you've all really enjoyed, but also um, the big collage concerts that people have been putting together that have been obviously super sophisticated and time consuming. Um, but how that has as a genre has evolved um, when it started with people with some videos in landscape and some videos in portrait and some people a bit out of sync and you know to actually into some some really very very classy now offers of of incredible videography and it's sort of almost a new little mini art form within itself so actually being imaginative with that uh, that possibility has been exciting to see that kind of that journey maybe that's actually another change that we're still going to work through is that when we do get back to live the visual element of what we do is going to be increasingly important 
Um, and I know that when we do get back, we, we will probably have socially distanced audiences. But again, I think we can do some cool things with that. So rather than being seen as a, as a penance or a punishment, we can change things up a bit. I mean, just think about the choirs. We can do different shapes and, and it'll be easy to move people around because we have to. This has been obviously and remains a tough time for the arts and, and music. Uh, nonetheless, I wanted to ask each of you finally, um, what have you usefully learned through all of this? And perhaps hand in hand with that, what good you hope comes of it in the future? I think for me, the biggest thing that I've learned is that no matter what's going on externally in the world or in people's lives, there's, there's always a need for music. And I think there, there's been a lot of kind of fear recently. I mean, there was before the lockdown as well that, you know, music is, is dying in certain places or maybe being given less relevance um, in schools and this kind of thing. But I think even if that's true in, in some cases, it's also never really true because people will always need music and will always want to have music in their lives in some shape or form. And I think we can all take confidence and joy in that fact and, you know, always keep finding ways to be creative and, and playing music because there's always going to be a need for it. You can't lock it down, can you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think uh, for me, it's about um, what the concept of quality is, has been a really a, an interesting question. Um, because as a classical musician performing in big classical halls, you're kind of, you have an image of what quality is and what sort of almost this sort of perfection is that you're trying to achieve. Um, but actually this has shifted that quality more, more towards a quality about connection and a quality about meaning and about relevance and about saying something that people need um, and value now. So I think, although on our, when we had our little street band, um, I did have my own inner tussle around the quality of what we were sharing because of the way we were doing it. You know, we had no rehearsal. We had, you know, sometimes it was really freezing and the intonation was crazy and some people rush and some people drag and all, the, all, that, all that stuff. Um, but actually it wasn't about that. You know, it's like I had a little word with myself and say, that's actually not important anymore. What's more important is that we're doing something that is valuable and it is good enough. Um, but that actually that that striving for that sort of esoteric perfection is I'm not saying it's not valuable it, of course it's valuable but it, there are other there are other values as well I, I think the point you make are, are brilliantly put and I, I couldn't agree more I think what it's reinforced to us is the fundamental intrinsic value of, of music and in, in a way re-gauge about what that means to us and that you're right sometimes we do get hung up about the quality and maybe it's not quality in terms of you know our things we're always looking at articulation intonation and all the things of the detail but maybe we need to be more focused and, and come back to the fact of music is relevant if it's the intent that is behind it that makes it real or authentic or important or valuable rather than yes quality is important and we need that I just think about from the profession you know through the amateur world there's it's a and right through to youth and schools as we know it's a complex ecosystem isn't it but if, if, if it's been led from the right heart and we value what we're doing that's what music's about that connection if it's connecting to people it does matter and it i think you know it really it's it's reinforced to me that what we do is of value yeah, I, I'm completely with all of you, and um, you've all nicked my answers. But in all seriousness, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think what, what you what you said about um, uh, I, I, mean, I thought of it as perfectionism, and in the first two weeks of my online stuff, I was recording and editing and and creating these sort of twenty minute broadcasts. I was spending eight ten hours a day getting them absolutely right, and if I made a single mistake, I'd go back and film it all again. And I had to let that go. I had to just think, no, it's not about getting it perfect. It's about building the relationship with the with my audience, with my choir, with with the people I'm trying to help. And I guess that's the thing that I've learned most that 
really understanding that music is about relationships, whether it's my relationship with the music, my relationship with the instrument, my relationship with the choir, their rela relationship with each other, the relationship with the choir, with the audience, you know, what does that look like? Is that a static thing? Is that something that constantly is evolving? And I think it's very much the latter, you know, that, that the t what we've actually had here is a huge opportunity to just sit just really test this technology how far can we push it you know uh, people were saying right at the start zoom well you know can we rehearse at the same time and people say why can't we and I said well it's it's this pesky speed of light business but you know we'll work around it uh, and in the end everything that we've come up with all of these immense musicians and te technological um, whizzes have created a new ecosystem that actually is is valuable and, and is building new relationships so that when we come out of lockdown whenever we have a treatment or a vaccine or you know whatever it looks like it won't be the same it will be something new it'll be something 21st century um and i guess in a way it's that's that's what i've learned that it's about relationships and it's about this opportunity we've got to to build a new relationship with music well, my goodness, um, I regret we're out of time today, but I do hope you at home have drawn some inspiration from our guests and a glimmer of the remarkable, resilient musical spirit that runs through this nation's veins. Um, you may even be tempted to find out about fabulous and very welcoming amateur music groups in your own neighborhood, in which case do visit the Making Music website, a veritable haven for choirs, bands, and orchestras that you can join. Um, you might also like to consider becoming an RPS member and join us as we set out to explore and to celebrate more of what makes Britain Philharmonic. For now, many thanks and much admiration to our guests today, Isa Kane Mason, Catherine Arledge, Helen Harrison, and Ben England. <laughs>